Hello all, all Geek here and uh, back to looking at magazines and this is White Dwarf from February and March 1978, it's issue 5, um, I'm going to alternate now, um, going with Dragon, then White Dwarf, then Dragon, then White Dwarf, so we get a decent comparison because I'm up to about this time in terms of the chronology of the, uh, the Dragon um, magazines so this way we can compare them nice and easily right something i have commented on before is that white dwarf's covers are consistently uh better than dragons and but i can see how um, a few mothers might not like this particular one because look oh, that looks a bit dodgy doesn't it oh yes oh yes okay um uh, yeah so let's skip past that cover <laughs> If I was a young boy, I'd have bought this this cover. But um, yeah, right, okay. Uh, it all looks a little, little bit. Yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, so, should, should we go back? Yeah, there, there, there's the cover. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at what's in this uh, particular uh, issue. Dungeons and Star. Oh, here we go. Dungeons and Starships. Fifty-seven Summer Row. Birmingham. That's where I'm from. I think it's the first one I've seen here from Birmingham. B3. That's in the, I think that's near the, near the city centre. Um, not entirely sure. I'll have to have a look. I'm not familiar with Summer Road, but I'll have to look to see where that shop was. Guarantee it's not still there anymore. But uh, we got Glasgow. We got Teesside. It was all London in the first first edition. But we got yeah Teesside. Um, Birmingham, Glasgow, yeah, it's spreading all over the country. Nerds everywhere. The nerds shall inherit the earth. Or should it be the geek? The geek shall inherit the earth. Okay. Um, right. A uh, bit of a grumble about copyright by the looks of things. Um, that's from Ian Livingston, isn't it? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, um, did you, is it a grumble or is it just an explanation of how copyright works? So, oh, it looks like uh, Star Wars, um, 20th Century Fox, um, and obviously a Star Wars, um, Star Wars terminology or Star Wars RPG, and some issues, perhaps. Um, and there's, looks like there's one here, a, a Middle Earth based one. The game Siege of Minas Tirith has disappeared from the shelf, soon to be replaced by TSR's Battle of the Five Armies, uh, soon to be followed by, uh, which may reappear at a later date, and who knows how long FGU's War of the Ring will last. So, uh, yeah, it's a piece to do with copyright and people making games about certain copyrighted content, which I suppose is fair enough, but it would have been back 45 years ago, it would have been something new for nerds to have to deal with right let's keep on going chivalry and sorcery okay so what's this about I think does it say a bit further up here have a look a mammoth game of wizardry and warfare by lewis pulsifer okay um is it his own game Is it a whole game that he's created that is being detailed in this magazine that's going to be released separately? Or or what? I don't know. I don't know. The general idea looks to be quite good. It can be used for a variety of game types, miniature warfare, um, miniature warfare and nightly tournaments. Um, fancy role playing with or without the addition of society, or as a grand campaign with everything. So, yeah, no, that, that that's fine. But uh, I think most games ended up becoming that way anyway. I mean, look, you got D and D, and they added on for D and D. They added on battle system. I know there was a mass battle system created for Beckney, um, and then we had Birthright. So. Versions of D&D incorporated mass battle systems along with the regular role-playing. So, 
Anyway, let's let's move on. Their Kriegspiel is fantastic. Okay, it's American range of fancy war game miniatures. Okay, it's a review of the Kriegspielers. What does he reckon they're like? The mage there. I know, is that, is that, it's not a great picture, so it's hard to work out the detail. It all looks a little bit generic. Just like a pointy hat holding a staff. It's a bit generic. You can't make out the detail. If the detail's good, that's fine, but it's not a good picture. Um, they're very, they are very old school. Um, that trident is severely overblown. The Warhammer looks decent. Yes, that is a Warhammer, not a pick. Um, is that a club? Proper length spears, metal majors. That's going to break within a few months. Um, well, yeah, they're, they're, a, they're a little bit bland, aren't they? Um, a little bit bland. I don't mind this this one here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. But I'm clicking on the, the, um, the ugly thing with the Warhammer and shield. Quite like that. I mean, okay, it's not the most exciting of poses, but I think the, the armor, and, armor and weaponry looks quite authentic on that. Okay, let's have a little look down here. Sorry about the yawn. Um, yeah, it's all, it's, it's all a little bit bland and generic. There's an archer doing archery stuff, but people just sort of stood holding weapons, and blowing on a horn. Um, but for the most, most part, it's just like, I'm standing here, I'm holding a weapon. Okay. I get it's in the early days, so they were limited by the uh, design and the, the um, technology they got. Monsters Mild and Malign by Don Turnbull. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Listen to this. We continue this issue with a presentation of some of the more interesting monsters which have appeared in various D&D magazines. In particular, The Dungeoneer by Paul Jacques and Alarms and Excur Excursions edited by Lee Gold. I must stress that none of the monsters are of my own devising, although I have given them all a monster mark. Let it go, Don. Let it go. Please. <laughs> right. The bogey is an unusual humanoid with the head, horns, and legs of a goat. It's four arms. So it's a satyr with four arms. It is quite demonic, yes. It is quite demonic. Um, and it's got a stupid three-way flail that's going to get all tangled up. Um, utterly unusable. The Manta, when at rest, looks like a mushroom. Before they can attack, they must accelerate to their maximum speed of 300 foot per turn. Ah, oh. Okay. So they, they zoom in and they hit hard with a, with a good armor class. That's odd, that's odd. Cyclops is here, look. Uh, um, Cyclops of Mythology is a giant with a single central eye which hits with a large club. Yeah, that's, yeah. So they're adding uh, Cyclops to the uh, to the game and a gremlin as well. The origin, I think the origin of the term gremlins was the First World War. Um, and they were fabled little people that were said to cause um, issues, reliability issues, with the early planes because they didn't want to blame them on the mechanics and the engineers. So they used to say that the gremlins have got into the engines and they sort of took on the personification of little people. I think that's, I think that's the origin of the term gremlin as a, uh, a little person that is a mischievous imp. What else have we got? The Sphex is a steal from science fiction. Cross between a spitting cobra and a wildcat. Okay. 
gold eater imps oh here's imps okay so these are like, like gremlins uh iron demon Mo mobile dis Threep. Gold eater, I've already said that one. Look at the editor's note here. Next issue, we will see the start of a new regular feature entitled The Fiend Factory. This will be a page or so of new monsters submitted by White Dwarf readers, readers and edited by Don Turnbull, who will apply a monster mark to each monster published. But The Fiend Factory, of course, spawned The Fiend Folio, which thankfully didn't have any monster marks in it. I wonder if, I wonder when, at which point in time, Don Turnbull realizes that Monster Mark's a bad idea and just gives up with it. We'll we'll have to find out. We'll have to find out. So basically, from this point onwards, um, readers were sending in their own monsters, many of which made it into the Fiend Folio, and got that lovely Russ Nicholson art. A lot of them did. Okay, D and D campaigns. Oh, this is a this is always a very constructive article by Lewis Pulsifer. He he wrote some really good articles in White Dwarf single versus multi world campaign. So this is is this sort of planes hopping or um, yeah jumping between worlds with the same set of characters. And it's nineteen seventy eight, so it is nice and early, isn't it? Um, single characters versus multiple characters. I've always struggled with the idea of a single character campaign. Um, it, it wouldn't appeal to me, having to because of the swinginess of the dice, having to tone down um, encounters so much. I like the idea of having a group, and of course, of course, when you start out, it's difficult to hire enough people to join you because you haven't got the cash, and it doesn't. It, it just isn't as fulfilling. If it's one player doing all the role playing with the DM, um, it's much nicer to have other people to bounce ideas off when you're playing. I guess needs must. Sometimes you just haven't got any friends. Yeah, it's that's what uh, that's what happens. Yep. Many times in my teens, I'd sit at home thinking, yeah, I'd love to play D and D, and all my friends would be doing their homework or living at home 12 miles away, or whatever. I should have been doing my homework, but I was thinking about D&D. Alignment. Referees who run all alignments virtually the same way are shortchanging their players. Correct! So, the, okay, this to me is a typical Lewis Pulsifer article. It's constructive. It's helpful. Um, how to incorporate alignment. Treasure rule, treasure division rules also differ. In a lawful party, players should work together to test magic items. Yes, yes, you work together. Chaotic party, it's like, ha ha, I'm having this. Resurrection. Uh, yeah, while there won't be any seventh or higher level player clerics early in a campaign. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, but yeah, go, go and find an NPC and pay him. Bookkeeping, languages, magic. All sorts of little tips. Good. Good, very nice. Open box. This is the review section in uh, in White Dwarf. Book of Monsters, Book of Demons, Book of Sorcery. Or a little soldier. Right, okay, it's a... Uh, a book that can be adapted for use with fantasy games, such as D&D. &D. Um, so I'm guessing it describes various monsters and what they do without giving them specific system stats because it does say underneath um, not intended specifically for any particular game so <laughs> it gives you some clues for conversion protection class 3 is equal to board leather armor D&D AC 7 class 5 to steel armor AC 3 okay so it gives you some conversion notes but obviously it stops short of being purely D and D, because obviously you want you want them to be flexible, but you don't want the wrath of the uh, the copyright people. But it does say they are the books are short, two pound fifty. Well, two pound fifty for forty or fifty page books now seems good, but obviously back then it's quite a lot. 
Um, right. Yeah, Book of Sorcery is much too short for £2.50. Okay. Bit of a negative review then. War of the Ring, Fantasy Games Unlimited. Okay, this is one of the ones I mentioned at the start that could well be um, cut short. Then you give it 5 out of 10. And they reckon it's a bad presentation, expen it's expensive, no control markers and will ambiguities. Um, how much did it cost? I didn't see how much it cost. Six ninety five. Mm, six ninety five. Probably talking about thirty to forty quid nowadays, which is normal for board games. So obviously, I'm guessing the uh, it all feels a bit cheap. It felt a bit cheap. All the world's monsters, hundred and ten page fantasy and D and D play aid. Uh, it's another monster book, but a hundred and ten pages for five pound fifty. That's not too bad. Do that multiply by six thing, about 30 quid, 110 pay. No, it, that's normal. That's actually quite normal. It's not that great. Multiple, yeah. Yeah, it's still, um, yeah. Seems better than that book above. Again, looks like a generic monster book. Um, what sort of review does it get? I found few monsters in the collection which brought a smile, cruel or otherwise, to the face, and even fewer which prompted the reaction, I wish I'd thought of that one. Okay. So, in aiming for quantity, I think they've sacrificed a degree of quality. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Churning out 110 pages worth of monsters and not really putting much thought into them. Okay. Fair enough. Miniatures... The 1978 Time Lord Trophy. Oh, this thing's going on outside. It's at Southampton University. Uh, Games Day Report. Ah, okay. There was a quiz on D&D &D rules by the looks of things. Let's be OD and D. Because to what level can a dwarvish bard progress? Well, if you're talking A D and D, they can't. Um Seems like how many types of potions are listed in the rules? It depends on the game system. Um which system were they were they were doing it with? D just D&D, &D. okay, so be OD&D. &D. There are a lot of different books out. Okay. Was Holmes out by this time? Ah, we have some pictures of the people involved. Um, Bill Howard, Don Turnbull, that's Don Turnbull. Ah, well, why am I pointing at the monitor? <laughs> Can't pick it up on the camera. Um, he's the one holding the uh, thing here. The one with the slightly receding hairline with the L and the Y just above his head pointing down at a picture. That's Don Turnbull, Mr. Monster Mark Obsessive. Tony Ball and Rob Thomason. Okay. Food and water on the Starship Warden. Uh, it's sci fi. Not a terrible piece of art, but I'm not interested, really not interested in sci fi stuff. So we can keep going, keep going. I don't know, what, what game's this for? Let me just check. Hmm. Metamo metamorphosis. Isn't it metamorphosis alpha? Is that a typo? Because that says metamorphosis. Hmm. Okay. Not my thing. Yeah, metamorphosis. Okay, typo. Right. I'm not... My scroll wheel on my mouse is is playing up a little bit, so I'm having to sort of use the key, keys to flick down. Yeah. Oh, now 
I'm not going to read this particular this particular uh, comic or um, cartoon strip, or whatever you want to call it, because uh, it's quite long. But look at the quality of the presentation of, of the art. That's pretty high. That is pretty high. I don't know the quality of the story, but uh, Kalgar, new sword and sorcery hero. That's but that's that is decent. Decent art. Very readable. Very well presented. Treasure chest. New magic items. Rainbow sword plus three. Mass charm ability on 1 to 10 humans and humanoids, usable once per day. It all must be held up before those to be charmed for one full turn to allow its rainbow coruscations to affect them. Saving throws as per mass charm allowable once the victim is charmed. However, he will never break the enchantment. A sword may affect the wielder and his friends and followers. Okay. It's an intelligent sword, potentially a devious sword. Which I like. Water of beguilement. Or oh, more charming. Right. Okay. Those, this is a sparkling, sweet smelling, very enticing liquid. So it's, this is a cursed item, isn't it? Those citing it must save versus charm. Once saved, cannot be charmed by it, and will not drink. Failure to save results in it being drunk. Results as follows. Ouch. 20% chance of losing one point from the prime requisite stat. Ten point... Oh, look, look at those penalties! Look at those... Lose two full levels of experience immediately. Death, no saving throw. Well, they've already had the saving throw. They've already had the saving throw, so death. Why would they have an extra saving throw? Um, where's 81 to 90 percent? 81 to 100 percent? Part of, oh no, it's up right at the top here. Okay, so I missed that. Polymorph, Gesh, no effect, no effect at all. Ah. 5% chance of no effect at all. <laughs> Water enhancement, though, that... Yeah, you've got a, uh, a vile-smelling liquid, but it comes out with mostly good effects. 10% chance of something bad. 90% chance... Um, no, no effect, 30%. 60% uh, chance of something really good. So, it's not quite as good, but... It's not bad. But yes, you've got the beguilement and the enhancement. To a good one and a bad one. The Asbury system. There have been many attempts to pr uh, produce a perfect experience point system for D&D, but most such attempts have been pretty poor. BX. I'm sorry, but XP for GP just works. It just works. It fits the fragility of the characters, gets the players thinking, and um, having classes advance at widely differing rates. It works. There you go. So the Asprey system is a um, a way of doing of doing XP. Right. So. They've given up with Monster Mark, and now this, this, this looks an overly complicated way of doing XP. <laughs> yes. It does, it does look complicated. It's individual XP. Uh, based on the killing blow and things like that, is it? No, no need, no need. Just get to the end of an adventure, you total up all the uh, enemies that they encountered and dealt with in some way, as long as there was a risk. So that's the key, risk involved. If they bribed them, if they charmed them, if they put them to sleep, if they slaughtered them, if they chased them off, or even if they started a fight and then ran away. If the risk is involved, they get the XP. 
Then you add up the amount of loot that the whole party's got. You put it all in a big, big, big pool and you divide it between all of the surviving characters equally. Easy. No need to get any more complicated than that. It works. Letters page. Ah, somebody writing from New York. Somebody writing from Camberley. Oh, you're the king again. I do apologise. Oh, yeah. Mm. Some clubs. The fact they're advertising a, um, a club in Austin, Texas, shows that White Dwarf must be reaching America. Good. One in Nottingham, one in London, one in Texas. Um, one in Hampstead, that's London as well. Um, I'm asking for alcoholics. <laughs> and one in Aberdeen, up in Scotland. So, yeah, good. Spreading the word, spreading the word. Getting out there. It's at the end. Well, well, well. Um... That's a really nice piece of art, that Fangarn art, the back cover. I like that. I think that's excellent. Really, 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 really good. Like some demonic bu butterfly thing. Is it meant to be a good guy or a bad guy? You can't tell, actually. I love the butterfly wings. Very nice. Very good. Um, yeah, quite an interesting addition. I mean, he's still mentioning the monster mark. A bit of sci-fi in there, but you expect that from time to time. There appears to be Lewis Pulsifer beginning to create a whole game in there. Um, 24 pages still feels slender compared to Dragon. But I think the quality of the contents were pretty good in this, in this edition of White Dwarf. Um... Some of the ideas for monsters. Lewis Pulsifer's help sort of article, um, giving various tips. Good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Um, so, White Dwarf heading back in the right direction. Good to see. I hope you've enjoyed the run through. I've been the Old Geek, and I'll see you in the next video.